We have spent a considerable time in the last uh, few weeks talking about seeking the face of God and finding the grace of God, taking the place that God has for us, and running the race that He's given us to run. Luke chapter 10, we talked about Martha and Mary. And there really is only one thing. The, the one thing that is needed, that is necessary, that, that far surpasses any other need in your life. No other chore, no other responsibility should come before being at the feet of Jesus and listening to His every word like Mary. Lots of other things to do, isn't there? We got guests coming. We got a clean house. We got a cook. Amen. Elizabeth shared not long ago, and, she, and I may need somewhere to eat if I share this. Anybody got some good lunch today? I might come and visit them. Hallelujah. This be a day for a good, a good home visit in the making right here. But you know, and I think we're all that way, and ladies especially, because their home is their home, and and uh, they want everything clean, and, oh, we can't ask them over. My house is dirty. Oh, we can't have them. No, oh, we can't do that. I, I ain't clean house, and, I, yeah, and we make all these. And what we're really saying is a clean house is more important than companionship and friendship. And, and I understand the deal. I'm, I'm, I'm similar ways. I, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying if we're not careful, that good can rob us of being with people that we love, and we love them. And finally, I think pretty much Elizabeth got to the deal, said, hey, you know what? You know what's good for that, too? Is go to somebody else's house and see their mess. Hey! <laughs> Amen? I remember Elizabeth did that one time. She went to a girl's house. And we just think everybody's house is just spotless. Well, some people, you know, they got it together. But the rest of us, no. <laughs> Amen. But, but we think everybody's just, oh, got it together and everything's in its place and got a place in its place and everything's just decently in an order and everything. And then one time she went to a friend's house in Omaha that was, you know, of course she thought that because that's the impression and, you know, we just assumed that and maybe they gave us the impression for whatever reason. She went there and it was a mess. Elizabeth went like, oh. <gasps> I feel so much better. <laughs> huh? So that person's mess kind of set her free right there. Martha? People do not see the dirt in your house that you see. Uh huh. They don't. <laughs> well, even if they did, you know, that's their problem. No. Yeah. That's right. Well, I appreciate the warning there. Man. I mean, no, I'm kidding. But said they're especially people with the gift of hospitality, like, like Martha and, and, and Pat. And so, but if we're not careful, we'll do like Martha did and let that need, and there were needs there. There were legitimate needs. Jesus was hungry. You know, I'm sure he wanted to eat. But Mary had it together. She said, you know, there's, there's nothing more important than being at his feet. And so, I, I, as I, I, I want to say that again and emphasize that we're going to talk a lot about works and love. We've talked about that, how they are completely inseparable. And if you love God, you're going to serve God. If you love God, you're going to have the works to show for it. You're going to have faith, and that faith without works is dead. It's the love of God that compels us, amen? We don't do it to earn favor. We don't do it to earn His love. But because His love has been shed abroad in us so mightily, you can't help but serve. You can't help but let the... You be a vessel for the love of God that, that is in you and flows out of you. How do you do that? It manifests through serving and loving other people. Nobody's going to see the love of God unless they see it through you. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You get to reflect Him. We have the privilege of representing Jesus to a lost and dying world. And so we're going to seek his face. Amen. We've got to encourage. This is kind of what my heart has been for the last few weeks. To encourage one another to love and the good works. And I guarantee you, my number one priority is to get you or to provide an atmosphere and an opportunity to love, for you to fall in love with Jesus. 
Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be filled with the Spirit. And I guarantee you those other three things are going to fall in line. If you really love God with all your heart, so you're full of the Spirit of God, you're going to find your grace. You're going to take your place, and you're going to run the race because you love your Savior so much. You're not doing it out of, out of a duty. Boy, you're doing it out of a love for God, and you want to serve God. So number one thing is love. Love God and love others. And it manifests itself in you serving other people. we got to encourage each other to do that. Amen? So love and faith and works, they're inseparable. And again, you can't know the Lord and not do many good works. Now, we know a lot of people doing good works, and they're not doing it in the name of the Lord. They don't love God. They're doing good works. Right? Jesus talked about them in the Bible. They were casting out demons. They were prophesying, doing many Wonderful things, mighty things in my name, but he didn't know them. Seek the faith. It's knowing God. Amen? It's knowing him. It's having a relationship with him. It's having intimacy with God. And if we can do that as a church, as elders, our primary responsibility is for you, uh, provide an atmosphere and an opportunity for you to know and love God. Can't make anybody love anybody. That's your decision. Amen? But I guarantee you, we, if, if you're really in love with him and you're flowing, you're full of his spirit, boy, pastor, how can I serve God? What can I do? Yeah, in other words, I ain't going to have to tell you to, love, to serve other people. Amen? Amen? You're going to be doing that. It's a natural flow of the love of God that is in your heart. You'll do many wonderful works. And we'll take that good news and we'll put it with the good works and we will be the salt and the light of the world. You are anointed to serve. Amen? You're gifted. The power of Jesus lives in you. If we can get a hold of that, boy, fear has no place in our life. I'm talking about the overcoming resurrection power of Jesus Christ in you. Woo! I'm glad you're excited as I am this morning. Hallelujah. Woo! There you go. I know you are. Just don't, not crazy like I am. Yeah. <laughs> angel about that. Holler, angel. Let me hear you holler. See, there she hollered. Some people holler differently than others. Amen? Praise God. Sean, let me hear you holler there. Woo, see there, he got a holler right there. But you know, there is scriptural basis. That's Psalm 67, I believe it is. Shout in the, no, 47. Oh, help me, Jesus. One of them, either 47 or 67. Shout in the God with a voice of triumph. No, it doesn't. It says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. All right, that won't charge you no extra for that. Glory to God. But you can pay me. No, I'm kidding. But because we're salt and we're anointed and we can represent Jesus to the world, we can have influence, we can really have an impact upon our society. I believe we can change the culture. You can change the culture and the atmosphere of your home. You can change it of your neighborhood. Come on. Don't shortchange the Lord. And we're surrendered to Him. We can have an influence in our workplace. Amen. You can change the nature and the atmosphere and the culture of everywhere you go because of Jesus Christ and the grace of God in you. And so we're talking about a life spent for Jesus. And Paul said it very, very plainly. He said, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I'll give what I have spend, and I will give all of myself. I'll be spent. And I'll tell you this morning, unless you're living a life spent for Jesus, you're living a life that ultimately will not be fulfilled. Your life will not be fulfilled. You were made to serve God. You were made for the pleasure of God. You were made for the fellowship with God. You have a purpose, and when you're in that purpose, and you're walking in that purpose, then you'll be fulfilled. If you don't do it, then you'll, all, you'll be empty. You'll be one all my life. What's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? And you'll never really... Be happy. God wants you happy. You know why? Because he made you for a purpose. And that when you're in that purpose, when you're in that place, in that sweet spot, if you will. See, he's the maker. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, this phone's made for a purpose. And if you look at my screen, you can see I've used it, it looks like, for a hammer. I really didn't. But it sure broke up enough to be thoughtful. But the person that made this phone over there in, in uh, Korea, or I believe Korea, Samsung, 
they wouldn't be happy if I used this. If it doesn't serve the purpose it's made, the maker's not happy. Amen? Amen. And if you don't serve the purpose for which you were made, God is not pleased. He doesn't have pleasure. He really takes pleasure in his people when they're serving him, loving him, and doing what he designed them to do. Ooh, that's good. Everybody say amen. amen. And so we have an opportunity to live our life, spend and be spent for your souls, for your souls. And so we're seeking his face and finding his grace. Paul told Timothy, devote yourself to your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Don't miss the opportunity to do what God has designed you to do. Don't go to the grave saying, I wish I would have. If only I had. Well, what if I would have known to do what's in your heart to do? God put it there. And because of fear, because of some other uh, uh, situation, we refrain from doing what God wants us to do, to step out in faith and do it for God. And then we get to the end of our life and we, 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 we die with regrets. I want to die like Joshua. He did everything that the Lord commanded him to do. He left nothing undone. As I said before, weeks ago, I want on my epithet, my, 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 my gravestone. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> nothing, undone. nothing undone, all things well done. I, I hope they can put that on there when, when I go home. Nothing undone, everything well done. Thou good. And faithful servant. Hallelujah. And so we take our place. Beautiful scripture there in 1 Corinthians 12, 18. Take your place. What are you talking about, uh, uh, Pastor? The scripture says, God has set the members in the body. Amen. As he has purpose. To set in place. God sets people in place. Amen. And when you seek God full of his spirit, God will place you because of your gift. And the anointing he has on your life, he will place you in the body to serve where you're most productive, most helpful. God has set the members. Set the members. And then we get the opportunity, the privilege to run our race. And we run it with endurance. We run it with perseverance. Paul said, I'm going to finish my race. Finish the race. None of these things move me. Man, the trials and temptations and and, and things that happen in this world. None of these things move me. Why? That I might finish my course. This was his heart, his passion, his goal. I want to finish what God has put in my heart to do. He says, I am compelled. Woe is me, he says, if I don't preach the gospel. How terrible it would be. I, we need to have that attitude. Boy, it would be a terrible thing for God to bless me, anoint me, and gift me with all that he has, and I not use it for his glory. I squander it. I don't take advantage of every opportunity. I live my life my way, selfishly, go through life for what I can get out of it, instead of spending myself for the kingdom and for the glory of God. Poor Paul, I hear his heart. It would be so terrible for me and you and me if we don't do what God purposed and designed us to do. Necessity is laid upon me. And God works in teams. Amen? If Lucy was here, I would say, Teamwork, and she would say, makes the dream work. So, y'all say it with me. Teamwork, Teamwork. amen. We hear about Paul, we read about Paul. Turn with me in Romans chapter 16. This just blesses my socks off. Because we read about Paul and think, oh, the wonderful, the great things he did. I'm not denying that, I'm not belittling that. The apostle Paul, come on. Mighty man of God. Amen. But I guarantee you what? He didn't do it by himself. And I'm here to tell you, I believe God, he sent them out two by two, didn't he? The disciples. He sent out the sick. 
it's teamwork. How many of y'all watching the final four, final eight, or whatever? Getting down to the final four, isn't it? Teams that they don't always have the best players, but they have the best teamwork, the best spirit. They don't have ball hoggers on the team. They don't have people there wanting the glory, individual glory. They want the team to win. And as the guy said last night, and I'm sorry he beat Kansas. I should have even brought that up, Ed. That's okay. It was, it was not Kansas State, was it? It was the other school. Anyway, it wasn't Kansas State. It was Kansas. But the guy said, we're playing as a team. We love this sport. And I was, he didn't talk about, it. well, I'm good. And he was the number one player. They called it, I don't know what the March or Mark or something. Anyway, just he was the very, to a large degree, responsible. But he gave the credit. We, our team, we love this sport. We work together. We're fighters. We, we, we get the job done. And God never designed any of us to work individually. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And the other one had a tattoo of the face of Jesus on his shoulder. Wow. Wow. And I noticed, for, it was strange to me, I, did, I didn't notice that, but I, I noticed the lady that was interviewing, it might have been the same interview, said, God bless y'all. I never heard that. I, thought, I mean, this was the sports person. Never heard them say, well, God bless you. I hear the, many times the athlete, you know, give glory to God and say, God bless y'all and, and all that. But I thought, that was strange. I didn't, I didn't get in on all the interview. But we've got to give God an opportunity to let us work together, partner together with other people. You can do a whole lot more together than you can separate. And God gets the glory. Romans chapter 16 blesses my heart. And I look at there with me. I, I can't pronounce half their names. I've never been to Bible school. And I went to A&M. They didn't teach us Romans 16. No. I know Romans 16, but I still can't pronounce all these people. But here are 35 names of people. Paul, wrapping up this book, what does he do? He said, let me tell you about my team. Let me tell you how we were able to do what God did through us. It wasn't just me. I commend you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church, that you may welcome her in the Lord. Notice the women. Amen. Hey, ladies, you can teach. <laughs> Amen. You can minister. Amen. Just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> to help her, whatever she may need. She has been a patron of many, of many, and of myself. Priscilla, Aquila, my fellow workers, on down. I'm not going to read them all, but count them. I counted 35. There may be, my math is a little weak, but. Greet my beloved Epanitus, who was the first to convert to Christ in Asia. Mary, I like Mary, I can pronounce Mary. Andronicus, Junia. Oh, I like down here, well, later on it says Justice. That sounds like an East Texas, you know, redneck. Oh, Justice! Hey, don't forget Justice, man. J-U-S-T, oh, Justice, you know. All these fancy names you can't even pronounce. And then there's Justice. <laughs> I like Justice. But uh, uh, Mary, Andronicus, Junior, Amphilius, Urbanus, Stachus, Apelles, Aristobulus. Woo! Yeah, Rufus, too. Uh, Rufus, there you go. Herodian, Narcissus, Trifini, Trifosa. Woo, if I ever had more children, I'm going to name them Trifosa and Trifini. 